welcome all maybe more people will be joining in a while but since it's live streaming uh, people are waiting outside zoom as well so to introduce today's topic of discussion we intend to talk about uh, india's health digital infrastructure primarily on how india has been investing on the digital side of healthcare and uh, what has happened so far we have with us ting wong ting is a postdoc uh, fellow and researcher at microsoft research microsoft research she works out of bangalore and she has been doing some ethnographic study on in terms of how technology design is being deployed in hospitals in india and we have sutit vaidya sutit is a co-founder of credible health uh, sutit is a masters in biomedical design from iit madras he has been working on ai solutions in healthcare over the years and we have ayush rati who is a policy officer from center for internet and society cis has been working on the policy side and the law side of uh, healthcare data uh, that is so today's topic of discussion as i was mentioning was primarily centered around the national health data blueprint uh, which is what was an evolution of the national health stack which was proposed to the government uh, through niti aayog by uh, industry tech group icebot uh to give a brief background of what has happened within healthcare infrastructure the idea to push healthcare data started with uh, the electronic health data records phr as it's referred to somewhere in 2013 2013 is the first time when electronic health records as a draft was notified and recognized and it happened finally because of interest in healthcare industry as well as some uh, interest and push by the world bank group and the who if i'm not wrong and the ehr electronic health records have been modified further in 2016 and we have the proposal proposals for national health stack and currently we are at this enterprise architecture system as the government is referring to to the national health data blueprint which is a sub system of a giant system called the india enterprise architecture so health is one component of it and part of the health data blueprint the government wants to build a uh, health data ecosystem so you will have health data exchanges uh, so this is going to talk a more into that we will start with ding and her ethnographic study in indian hospitals and how technology has been used in indian hospitals hello let me first unmute myself um so what i'm going to talk about today is going to be the uh, field work that we had conducted in uh, a large indian hospital chain um so as shrinivas has introduced um uh i'm a postdoc researcher in uh, microsoft research um india so this research is not specifically linked with the health stack or um other initiative but um we thought it would be good to share some of the learnings from the ground to give you an idea where what is the status quo that's um happening within a hospital in terms of the digital transformation despite all the hypes on uh, all, all of the the data and digitization so within the for those who don't know um about this um uh ethnographic study is a type of um a uh, sociological study uh, that through through a close look at um I, i guess the environment and context and specifically the work that goes around um using observation and interview we get a very detailed sense of you know what's actually happening in the ground so through this study um, what we find is that the hospital is very in, invested in you know electronic patient record or health record that um they are not only so they have more than one system running at the moment they have existing one uh, that they are using and they are also investing in getting a new and updated one there hmm. um so one of the things while we were doing this um study that's particularly fascinating is that we also find on top of the use of this formal organizational digital tools um 
specifically the group that we observe or studied are nurses. They're also using a lot of uh, WhatsApp to walk around um, the tool that are um, that are that this organization is using um, for the reasons um, that the tool the organization is using, particularly the electronic patient record is not particularly user friendly um, to say the least. So um, while we were conducting this research, you know, this is a very large hospital. Um, they have many um, patients come in daily and they also have many hospitals across different geographic location as well. So using uh, electronic health record or patient record is of value to this hospital because it's a very structured communication tool, um, not only just between different um, departments within one hospital, it also helps to set a structured data and information across the hospital chain as well. And, you know, like any other electronic health record, it is designed with multiple user in mind. So, you know, it's the system um, that's slightly different from what we understand as a work tool or a personal tool. You know, it's not one laptop or one desktop per worker. Many of them share uh, a terminal or share a desktop that's within either with a nurse station or some other location within the hospital. Um, so that is something, you know, the electronic patient record have considered in mind, but still there is some dissonance between what has happened. And what we hope that this sharing the lesson learned today, as well as, you know, what we report back to the hospitals to for us to rethink about um, some of the technology design that we are uh, implementing in the ground and how does that affect the people who are ultimately using them. So currently the electronic health record um, is not the, uh, the best system to use from what we can see or what we've learned from the field. It's incredibly time consuming to use, um, largely due to the user interface design. So for example, um, the search function in this um, health record is particularly bad. Like it takes them quite a, well, it takes nurses uh, or the pharmacists a long time to just search for a patient and then be able to uh, update information about that patient. And also because this system is rather rigid, it doesn't support in time uh, communication within the tool and it often doesn't support dynamic changes what's happening to it is that it's being used as a data repository. What do I mean by that is that, um, you know, as we are imagining things happening in the hospital, things happening with the patient, the nurses goes around and input the doctor's um, notes into the system and sometimes input the prescription into the system. It's often done with a delay. For one, that's because the nurses work, you know, have to be centered around taking care of the patient. Then later on, they can deal with the documentation of it. And secondly, it's not a dynamic system that you can do things uh, as things happen. So that means, you know, what is supposed to be a dynamic system is you used very um, as a static um, data repository. And this happens not just, you know, within the word, but also during the times when patients are being admitted to the hospital. Again, when, when patient is admitted to the hospital, it's yet another very dynamic um, process that involves many players' coordination to make the things happen. Whereas this system itself doesn't really support that many users to use it at the same time. So, you know, if we think about what really is, well, given all of those things that I said, um, is it a really good system to use? I do think so. So electronic health record is this one step, I guess the very first step the hospital has into uh, digitizing the workflow they have. And it is useful for the hospital, particularly if you think about what it does is it makes um, the billing system, it makes the billing process a lot easier for the hospital and also for whoever involved in making billing work in the hospital. And because that, uh, another thing I have to say that I, I think particularly have been done well with the electronic patient record is how it is being connected with the insurance system. That, that again, makes this billing system a lot more smooth um, for a lot of um, us who have the uh, health insurance that you can just go in with a cashless um, process that also, you know, saves time for the patients as well. 
However, if you think about because of being such a rigid system and people have to work around it, what do they what they did was that then they used the personal tools to basically um, fill the gap. This to this electronic health record doesn't fill. The tool people went to is um, WhatsApp, and WhatsApp, you know, as we know, is this communication um, well a chat. App that has been adopted across the globe in many different work contexts and as well as within the healthcare context. And in the US and UK, because of HIPAA and uh, the NHS regulation, as well as GDPR, it's prohibited to use WhatsApp um, in, in healthcare settings altogether, in hospital by nurses or doctors. However, in India, um, such regulation doesn't exist yet, and uh, similar things in China. So people turn to these personal tools and repurpose them for work. Um, and I have to say, from what we can see, it's a very systematic use of uh, WhatsApp to get the work they need to done. They need done done. However, to relate back to what we are talking about today. Is there issues with using WhatsApp um, to walk around those formal tools? Of course there are. For one, uh, we are using a personal tool for work. There is no longer this clear separation of what's work, what's not work, if you're using personal tool on a personal device for work. And secondly, if we're thinking about a slightly larger scale, is that whatever been discussed on WhatsApp as information of this hospital, of the patients who goes into this hospital cannot be saved somewhere. Never mind the security and uh, you know confidentiality as well as privacy issues that's um, embedded in any chat tools. But also, as an organization, they're losing out on some information that hasn't been captured within the formal work tool, formal communication system that just lost within this um, informal tool. And even if you know we move this organization to adapt uh, to adapt some organizational communication tools, you know, we'll, for example, things that Microsoft could provide, or whatnot. That's there is still this caveat that um, because the electronic patient system um, is one on its own standalone tool, and whatever organizational communication system the uh, the doctor or the nurses use is another system, there isn't much of a data going between the two of them, that still means even if they use an organizational sanction tool, there is going to be this data dissonance between different systems. Never mind there are you know, multiple systems within a hospital, the legacy ones, the one they're currently using, things they haven't been migrated, things on a paper. So basically, this is what we're dealing with within the hospital, you know, despite all the hypes on um, the digital um, I mean, the data on healthcare and all of that, it is still not quite there yet. This is both because of the infrastructure, the work processes, usability, and also functionality of all the tools that we involved within a hospital. So I think with that said, uh, what I'm trying to set is that um, I, th I think potentially and ultimately we could benefit from um, having data about um, especially health data at one, pla one place, if it's secure, if it's anonymized, um, to understand uh, public health at a scale, which I think is a good thing. But um, we're definitely not there yet. On the ground, we are using various ad hoc systems and tools to get a work done, which is very important at the moment. And you know, this COVID-19 only stressed on that um, to deliver basic work is very difficult with limited resource never mind this flamboring talk about you know data and the health stack and all of that so this is all from me thanks ding uh we're gonna move on to sutte uh, who has been actually working and volunteering on some of these issues uh he has a health like a biomedical engineering background so he can also tell what is the actual engineering procedure that's usually followed and how to, how should one develop these systems? So the, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks Srinivas for uh, inviting me to this um, uh, talk. Um, let me, uh, before I, before I start talking about, uh, uh, you know, the data blueprint and, and different aspects of it, let me just try to give you a quick background of, of what I do, um, you know, outside uh, in my day job. 
so um over the last uh, about 4 years or so um we've been i've been the co-founder of a company called uh, predictable health uh, where uh, what we do is uh, is basically build artificial intelligence algorithms for radiology imaging and so what we are basically doing is we are trying to get machines to learn uh, to read um say x rays ct scans mri scans and so on um the the overarching idea being that hey there aren't enough um, radiologists who are who are these specialized doctors to read images um enough in the country so if we can augment their abilities using artificial intelligence then possibly we can uh, increase the number of people who can get diagnostic care um now a lot of a uh, lot of my perspective around um, um, around uh, you know the data blueprint and and how it should work has sort of evolved uh, from a very sort of uh, 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 from a very research or ai perspective um and obviously also a, a deployment perspective of how to how to get data based systems um out in hospitals today uh, primarily because you know the way we have operated is that you know obviously when we started one of our biggest challenges was hey how do you get uh, how can we get uh, all the data that we need to build these algorithms because you know we are talking about sensitive healthcare data and and these are not available in the you know, open source and and even if you get the uh, get data from the open source they're not probably not going to look like uh, what they would in real life Uh, so we needed data on day one, uh, you know, three years for 2016 when we started. We needed data um, so that we could build these algorithms, and and we went knocking on on almost every hospital. Um, that's uh, that's uh, hospital and hospital group and diagnostic center in India, uh, going and having conversations with them. Hey, can you share data? And and you know, over the last three years, it's been a very interesting journey that you know uh, we've uh, uh, that we've managed to um, uh, get. Uh, we've obviously gotten rejected by several several institutions, but we also managed to sign agreements uh, where we actually managed to get uh, a lot of this data. Um, and I contrast this this experience with mine with what it could have been if there was uh, a technology infrastructure layer which could have provided access, provided uh, you know access to startups like me. um building artificial intelligence um, uh, to have data accessibility not as such a you know uh, issue that needs to be solved over the course of one year or so but maybe in a few weeks or a month um and so that's 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 that sort of a you know quick um, uh, you know introduction about about uh, the background and and sort of uh, hopefully that helps give you gives you some flavor of of the perspectives that i will share uh, and so um and so just to give you an idea when i read about the national health data blueprint and and i started talking to uh, you know some folks of um, uh, folks from my spirit and so on the general idea that i got which seemed exciting to me is is that you know um, is the entire concept around how data today is is in silos within hospitals nobody has access to their own data and if you go to another hospital today um you don't have access to um you don't you there is no easy way to provide them access to your data which is stored in some other hospital records and it's it's either a paper based record which is very difficult to get out or it's or you have to get them written in cds dvds it's it's a nightmare and and, and standards are not easy to come by either uh, and so if you look at this from from the view uh, from the lens of what our banking system looked like uh before upi and and all the interconnectivity happened that exists today from core banking to upi uh, to what we have today uh i think there are some parallels that that i could see uh which could potentially bring be brought to to the entire um, healthcare data ecosystem and that's 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 primarily you know uh, one is can is it possible that patient um, has direct access uh to his medical records irrespective of which hospital uh, his data is record is saved can i provide uh, access to a new hospital uh, instantly without having to go through all the hassles and can i do this in a way that does not involve me uh, you know involve the state uh, having to aggregate or all the private players coming having to come together and aggregate all the data in one center centralized um, repository but but do it in a federated way you know similar to how maybe the how upi acts today that your data is still stored within the bank servers and you have a, uh, and you obviously have some fiduciaries in between who who sort of enable this access but can you have a, a similar system because uh, healthcare data can e- very easily get very large so it's not just you know very you know transactional data or text data that you need to sometimes just heavy images and signal data it's not that easy to share or or aggregate um uh, you know if even if you wanted to so what is a way that you can build it such that it can be federated um and and um, and and most importantly can you move the consent of of sharing this data away from the hospital 
to the patient so today you know for instance in my in my case um, even though i was using uh, so many patients data we in fact today are using so many patients data to develop our algorithms the the core um, uh, the discussion we have about uh, you know the the ethics clearances the commercial terms of of how and how we use this data all happens with the hospital and the patient is usually never involved and because it's mostly retrospective data you know consent is also most likely uh, most often we off uh, it's because there is no intervention or, or adverse event to affecting the patient at all um, and so this this you know this is similar to you know uh, if you think about it, it it's taking it's it's giving the entire uh, responsibility of the data and and the opportunity of commercialization and 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 figuring out all the terms around the data with the hospital um, instead of the patient uh, which which again i think is is fundamentally not the way it should uh, if you think about a system where you want in data interoperability the data rights and who gets to access it should not be uh, ideally be defined by the hospital it should be defined by directly by the patient um, and so so basically given this entire context of of how of, of the success we have around being able to integrate the entire financial ecosystem through upi and, and being able to bring interoperability the idea was is there is there a way that a similar kind of a data intra connectivity model could be established uh, in the healthcare ecosystem and it's a much much more difficult problem um, if you think about it um because uh, because one uh, you know uh, ehr um because one the data standards are not established so i think uh, like as rightly srinivas put out uh, ehr standards came out uh, several years back um but but the implementation of it is, is still challenging uh, if you go to any standard hospital today you will see that most of them you know i can give you a large large percent maybe you know 90% 95% of them do not have hand, do not have digital records they still use handwritten records very very minimal limited information only the information that is required for billing is is usually just entered on the ehr everything else is still managed on on some sort of records newer hospitals are increasingly um increasingly uh, entering but but you know you have to understand the indian healthcare ecosystem is very different from from our counterparts in developed countries because they have time to see every patient here you have 30 seconds for every patient so doctors don't have the time to do administrative work so so ehrs even though standards exist you have a fundamental problem the data does not exist the digital data does not exist you need a way to be able to collect collect this information uh, you know from the hospital get doctors to enter it in the first place um and the second part is is is, is that you know clinical notes is just a small tiny portion of the entire uh, ecosystem of data there is far more data that that exists beyond clinical notes you look at radiology imaging for instance you look at ecg you look at other you know sort of temperature blood pressure there are just so many so many biomedical data vital signs um, that can also potentially be used um, and and uh, you know uh, can give good information on on the patient record uh, whenever the patient needs to go to another site or another second opinion or even come back for follow up care very important information so so it's not just about clinical notes that you need to talk about and i mean it's not just about the ehr standards but it's rather standards for all the different kinds of data you know that that you can talk about you know starting even thinking about your wearables your your home health monitoring devices you know how can you get all of this data ecosystem into into a centralized place and and is you no know, while while a lot of the hospital data has you know has some place where you can store them maybe the hospital infrastructure you no know, if you have home health devices you have um, you know other kinds of devices where do you enter it how do you how does it come into the system you know all that are are, are sort of questions um that need to be answered and, and potentially opportunities that probably vendors can can come build um around the ecosystem itself and and uh, and you must understand that uh, you know the ehr system fundamentally came up in developing countries primarily because of the strong incentives around insurance uh, and payments that were linked to it and and it's no no way if you think about it it's no way the most optimal system because it's it's um, you know it's it's rather you talk to any physician in the us and and they will have nothing good to talk about emr it is a very clunky interface like ding just just talked about but also um, you know it's, it's it's it takes a lot of time you know doctors always almost have you know uh, backlogs of of patient records that they need to enter and, and and it's not so very fundamentally there is a reason to to go back and question why do we need ehrs what is critically important in these ehrs that we need to collect the raw data in, in many cases available do we still need the analysis and the reports 
um, to be recorded um, in in the report itself, uh, and and how do we uh, and how do we rethink from first principles what all we need digitalized and digitized in the data um, in the first place? Uh, so I think um, I, I think that thinking is very important for the Indian ecosystem because very simply just coming down and saying every doctor, every hospital should start using an ESR system is very impractical, and and most doctors will tell you the same thing that. They're still they're just not going to uh, implement it. It's not interoperability. It's not the technology that that uh, and the interoperability technology that's limiting uh, you know the adoption of EHRs, but but rather uh, you know the the workflow of the of the software itself. Um, but but let's let's assume that problem is, is sort of solved and you you figure out a way to to come up and and assemble all the data whether it's raw data whether it's the bare minimum discharge summaries prescriptions treatments uh, you know very limited data that you uh, that you uh, collect for the purpose of insurance and you know purpose of of billing insurance and let's say you know for whatever is needed to for clinical care itself you know so that the patient can go get a second opinion the patient can come back for follow up and and lack of data is not going to come in the way of him getting best care and and in all of those places i think the 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 the, uh, the work uh, of or what the data blueprint tries to uh, attempt to build in some way or form is to have some kind of data fiduciaries where you basically anonymize or basically delink the personally identifiable information from the information uh, from the data the raw data or the clinical notes so that those who have access to the inf personal you know, uh, identifiable information don't have access to the clinical uh, records and those who have access to clinical records don't have access to the uh, to the identifiers so that uh, you know uh, 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 that in that way you you probably can um, can uh, there is a data provider who matches the uh, data identify patient identifiers provides the clinical records in encrypted format and the and and the user at the and the application builder or the vendor and the other side who gets only the patient records uh, for his usage or for the purpose of transparency but does not have access to the patient records it's 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 um, there is a lot of uh, I think previous work that's happened in the financial sector uh, which is sort of a, a good um, uh, example to follow, and I'm sure there are loopholes mm -hmm. that many of you might be aware in this space, uh, which already exist. Uh, I am no expert in, in in how to exactly manage the data exchange uh, so that it is federated and and spread across all these all these uh, hospitals. Uh, the challenge, the biggest challenge, when you compare it with what has been done in financial sector, for instance, is that you know the banks. There are about you know 10, 20 banks in all of India, and and you know maybe five, six large ones which command it percent of the market and they already have a core banking system but but in if you look at hospitals there are you know 5000 hospitals with more than 100 beds each and the total number of hospitals could be you know nearly 10 to 20000 and uh, each of them have a different it system so how uh, integrating who's going to go to each of these sites and and build a federated sort of integrated um, federated data access system which enables access to to all of these hospitals so these are these are you know open ended challenges that are going to come in the way of implementing such a large scale system so that you have data access but what what is important is that this plumbing needs to exist because without this plumbing, you know, in, there is a lot of um, a lot of potential applications and 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 technology evolution, technology opportunities that I think uh, we will miss out on. Um, you know, for instance, um, um, there are um, you know countries like um, Israel, for instance, which have a very strong integrated healthcare record system today, give rise to to many of the leading artificial intelligence providers um, in in healthcare, and that's purely because the the government opens up the data. Um, uh, for all these AI providers themselves, um, and and you know from from day one they they have access to several million patients, um, which they can use. Um, if India had a, a, a system where you could have uh, data access um, for for both development but also deployment of AI solutions uh, and the plumbing layer, if I may call it, of of enabling hospitals to all be able to talk the same language so that vendors can integrate, so that data interoperability is managed, uh, it really opens up an entire you know playing field or ecosystem of of um, of research in in sort of data driven models, uh, evidence based care uh, how do you improve care what is the most cost effective way of care uh, and and really gives rise to a lot of innovation among startups who can potentially leverage this data 
and and you know come up and and maybe uh, not just uh, get them deployed in india but potentially be global players because you know india is is literally uh, home to one of the largest populations if you have access to this kind and this scale of data the potential of the kind of applications that you could build is 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 you know is comparable to maybe only china um, and 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 the chinese are way way ahead um, in terms of their mandate to open up data to to ai providers um who want to use that data who want to use that data for for some kind of commercial interest um uh, and 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 you know i'll i'll sort of um, uh try to uh, conclude with that but uh, but i think what what is uh, what what is um, sort of uh, open ended and and is challenging is is obviously the uh, as we talk about all this uh, interoperability and connecting all the hospitals uh, to get access to data it is obviously uh, you know uh, we are talking about healthcare data biometric data by design uh, is very very diff difficult to anonymize um and the anonymous words so you can you know sort of within reasonable limits try to do what is uh, you know recommend what what should be standard practice for anonymization but if bad actors at one any point want to exploit the data and and sort of try to identify it's it's it's, it's it is a challenge and there is no foolproof mechanism for anonymization so, so it is it is um, you know it's something that i think requires a lot more work a lot more a uh, uh, lot more discussions to sort of arrive at at what is acceptable uh, very simply ensuring that bad actors don't get into the system in the first place uh, to try to maybe uh, simplify the solution a bit um and um, and um, and and, uh, and and secondly i think um, you know even if you do build all this interoperability and and uh, data interoperability framework what are the incentives for hospitals to to actually implement this and what do they get um how does it uh, really affect uh, affect them you know being able to bring more patients um can we use this data so that hospitals can project themselves better in in terms of outcomes in terms of patients in terms of patient experience in terms of in terms of anything else so so the entire ecosystem around how this data um, blueprint can actually improve uh, you know uh, the experience and 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 the business case for hospitals is is also something that that needs a lot of work a lot of selling a lot of uh, uh, thought around um and um, and that's 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 about it um happy to sort of uh, uh, answer more or take more questions as as we go um and, and that's, that's thanks so good i'm going to come back to you but we move to ayush to explain the complex problems of how do we even solve it and how the consultations are happening around this because while techies and practitioners and doctors all of them have a different set of issues hospitals and entire ecosystem ayush can come and probably tell us more about what's happening on the consultation and what's the government doing to enable all of this and where are the concerns especially privacy anonymization and what's happening with the healthcare privacy laws ayush you're up <coughs> thank you shrinivas um thank you ding and sutirth for uh for sharing everything that you did and for raising like tons of uh, pertinent points lots to unpack over there uh i'm going to jump in and talk uh, a little bit about sort of how we've come to this point where uh health like health systems in india are being increasingly datafied and my work specifically sort of looks at it from the perspective of welfare systems and provisions by the state and uh that is that the larger story that i want to start with so uh national uh, and uh, uh digital digital blue is the ndh which is the ndhb and uh talk about a few things um sort of that came up in uh in the consultation documents and at the consultation uh with the ministry itself so to sort of begin uh with how welfare systems have come to this point where increase and um this is so um from a perspective it's the true and this exit uh move of india in uh, move by the indian state in it uh, sort of adoption of the new liberal governance practices and by well the term is often very loosely used uh 
for me, it specifically entails a certain withdrawal of the state from the provision of public, um, you know, from, from the uh, provision of public services. That includes um, things that we are seeing today, in, uh, such as the uh, the linkage of the Aadhaar with the PDS system, uh, tons of welfare programs across ministries, both at the center and the state, being um, sort of uh, made into data-based systems uh, and searchable data-based systems uh, to sort of in, to sort of merge these silos and be able to create this uh, perfect profile of um, beneficiaries, and that's really where. Uh, the um, uh, where so many of the health systems that that I'll be talking about come in, and these these are not new. So uh, one of the oldest systems that we've been able to uh, uh, sort of look at is called the mother and child tracking system, which started in around 2003, 2004, um, under the sort of national e-governance program that was created at that point to use ICT based tools uh, for uh, to reach quote unquote underserved communities and to sort of rationalize uh, India's massive sort of social security and welfare programs expenditure. So a lot of the discussions that we then see, uh, and this is again linked directly to the concern that has been raised by several economists. Uh, sociologists, uh, activists, and uh, like large members of civil society uh, at that point itself, which was that this uh, this rationalization of expense is the sort of underlying intention behind the focus that has been placed on leakages and uh, corruption that are that are sort of in that inhere in India's. Uh, welfare systems and and that is when technological tools started being proposed as solutions so as far back as 2007 that is when the right to food case was being uh, argued in the supreme court that is the pucl case um, in one of the uh, interim orders that the co that the court had um, Court had laid down, building upon recommendations of a committee that had been set up. They had sort of uh, they had explicitly indicated that the welfare programs need to be quote unquote automated to um, to so, to make it more efficient, right? So this is again the language of uh, so we are sort of approaching the language of privatization, new liberalization, and uh, have moved pretty far away from the explicitly um, socialist approach of the Indian state prior to 1992. And this is where uh, the NDHB, the National Health Stack, and in its um, in, in their pervasive forms come in. But before that, there was something called the Integrated Health Information Platform. Uh, there were policy measures, uh, the EHR standard documentation. There were policy measures such as um, the Disha Act, which still haven't seen the light of day. And um, so with, while initially uh, in this sort of datafication process, there were, um, there were both national and central level health programs that were being datafied, but they were still very, they were still discrete and did not speak to each other. And um, the National Health Stack and the NDHP then seek to fix that problem. And they want they seek to create this um, overarching pervasive database. Uh, the the uh, in their words, it will be the single source of truth, and it will then contain uh, sort of deeply sensitive health information of if it's if this imagination is given sort of its full extent, then of every citizen in the country, and will record every interaction of. Um, each citizen from cradle to grave, uh, again, quoting from uh, the policy documents around, uh, the, around a lot of these welfare programs and also specifically the NDHB. So uh, the, and this comes hand in hand with the uh, national health policy, which again explicitly stated the leveraging of big data tools to 
ensure uh, to sort of have a wellness approach to healthcare in India and to to and again quoting Evgeny Morozov, using a techno solutionist approach uh, uses a techno solutionist approach to fixing sort of fixing underlying structural problems. Right, so there is never a thought given to how sort of let's say issues of access, issues of poverty need to be fixed, but it is assumed that the mere placing of a technological infrastructure will paper over these cracks and uh, and then potentially solve for these problems as well. And uh, so the national health policy then comes in, uh, places this incredible primacy on health insurance, which also the previous discussions have mentioned. And that is the situation in which um, the, uh, the, uh, the Ayushman Bharat Yojana, the ABY, uh, comes in and sort of seeks to, um, and is the latest iteration in the Indian government's attempt to provide universal health care. But this is still done through a focus on health insurance. And, uh, and that's what is then being, in, uh, that is being actually insured is this indirect fin targeting of demand side financing. So, uh, uh, so this is trying to fix problems that insurance-based models will have, not really health problems, as insurance model insurance-based models are characterized by uh, problems of information asymmetry, um, model hazard, uh, to sort of curtail the incentive to uh, over overuse health systems and uh, thereby preventing cost inflations and so on. Uh, an important point to be mentioned is that the UK uh, had had attempted to digitize its healthcare service similarly called the National Program for IT. And it was discontinued uh, in, in, I think, six to seven years. Like it was a complete failure. There was, uh, and there was complete, there was absolute political consensus around it. And uh, the biggest problems that it, um, and there's a sort of bunch of literature around it. Some of the key problems that were highlighted were that it was top down in nature, did not factor in for local decision making. And this is again a problem that the uh, that is uh, that inheres in the NDHB as well, and also other health data uh, uh, health health data systems such as the R the Reproductive and Child Health Portal or the MCTS, where um, uh, so health workers and data entry operators are already overburdened over, uh, overburdened in terms of um, the data entry requirements itself. But while they are the ones who are uh, who still do the data entry? Uh, it is that they. It is that they are never involved in uh, the decision making around what data has to be collected and how this data um, can be better processed or used for making reflexive uh, policy decisions that actually sort of contextualize the local needs, uh, uh, local needs of diverse populations uh, and underserved populations in the country, and especially given the sort of unique contours of the um, uh, of the Indian demographic in terms of um, both the density of population and uh, the geographical spread and sort of the inability to uh, be accessing uh, health, uh, welfare systems in the first place. The problems around access are especially pertinent because this is an assumption that all welfare datafication measures and explicitly in the uh, NDHP is uh, the the assumption is that of near universal coverage of uh, phones. So um, and in something like the NDHP, which has like a complex technological framework where um, uh, where patients are or I don't know consumers of the health system are supposed to interact with this infrastructures, and that is where the sort of consent framework lies um, it, it is it, it's not just phones that you need to be able to access but also regular con connection to the internet and then uh, access to smartphones so uh, so one problem is that of access and then this then this access is uh, so on the, is strictly mediated along uh, along uh, gendered lines in india so while there may be access uh, the, well, there may be phones present, like you may have um, non-smartphones present or feature phones present in most households in the country, but it is that 
women for example do not have uh, uh, do not have access to their personal phones and this is a major privacy violation especially in uh, especially when patriarchal gender norms are um, are continue to be rampant in continue to be rampant in the country and then also in uh, mediating access to uh, to the online and there is like uh, again there's several surveys that have been done one including that by digital empowerment foundation that talks about how uh, that how while we may have made strides in literacy, but it's digital literacy is uh, is severely lacking. They peg it at about ninety percent of the population not being digitally literate, and uh, again, this is a severe challenge, especially in terms of uh, the infrastructure that uh, systems like the NDHP uh, propose. And this is also a function of how the decision making is happening. It's happening in our urban centers. Um, uh, the uh, decision makers in, uh, ascribe to a certain Silicon Valleyization um, ideology. And this is, this is a sort of an, in, an uh, in a context which is strictly male dominated. And these all feed into the design of these systems and that instead of making sort of uh, of making welfare systems reach so underrepresented communities, it actually ends up further uh, excluding them. Now, the next thing that I want to quickly mention is the standards of interoperability and content that are proposed in the uh, in the in, in, in the NDHP. So um, there is there is a strong focus on open standards and interoperability, and that is truly commendable. But uh, it is. It, there's, we have again tons of uh, tons of experience around how it's it, it's incredibly difficult to operationalize, operationalize interoperability given the sort of menu of, of open standards that uh, that are there to choose from, and in the NDHB then specifically talks about decentralized personal data stores, um, so it's going to be a, uh, an incredibly federated architecture with uh, a central repository and tons of um, regional centers or at the sites of service providers. Uh, while on the one hand, it's already unclear what information will be stored in these repositories. So for example, what will be in the uh, central repository and what will be contained in the regional repositories. It's, uh, it, may, it may be the case that uh, uh, these problems further get amplified if, as Sutut mentioned, Sutut mentioned earlier, that health data can get exponential very quickly and uh, it sort of uh, it it may become a problem that becomes like really difficult to um, handle later on. The the next thing I want to um, talk about is uh, that of anonymization. Now, anonymization or de-identification has been a constant feature in um, uh, data in data protection data protection communications. Uh, the data protection discourse generally over the last few years, so right from the Shri Krishna Committee's data protection report, uh, at that point itself, they had mentioned how uh, methods of de-identification and anonymization uh, have, a strong, uh, have a possibility of failure. Earlier, Sutit mentioned that they are not foolproof as well. Uh, and the key reason why this may be the case is because quasi identifiers are used are still used to link seemingly anonymized data to uh, respective individuals and this is important this is for any for any uh, welfare system to work that focuses on reducing errors of targeting the identification is going to be is going to be in here in some uh, in these systems in some form or the other and how this is typically done in even in a in a framework where anonymization is thought of at from the very beginning is that of using posse identifiers to um, to, to link this and uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, link it to to link it to individuals, um, and it's especially pertinent to mention in uh, that why um, and a further tension sort of arises in uh, in so far as the NDHB seeks to uh, also create this ecosystem where private actors and startups may be able to leverage this information through the use of open standards and open APIs. That has been a constant feature of um, the stack environment, so India stack, health stack, um, 
and so on and this is this has been a central feature so this is and that is where innovation and that is regarded as the site of innovation but the disha act and uh, the the disha bill sorry uh, explicitly um, stated that digital health data um, whether identifiable or anonymized shall not be accessed used or disclosed to any person for a commercial pur purpose and in no circumstance be a, uh, disclosed to insurance companies employers um etc or any other uh, sort of entity as the central government may specify and and in doing so the disha act also squarely places the focus uh, places the uh, ownership of the digitized health data upon the individuals so um on the other hand the uh, uh the ndhb sort of or um, possibly intentionally chooses to um, to sort of ignore some of the recommendations that were made at that point in time and thus in and in doing so sort of it talks so much about the discourse around big data frameworks as well so the more the data the merrier it is um, and uh, and 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 thereby so this linkage is crucial to driving uh, innovation and sort of providing I'm, I'm sort of providing welfare services to um, um, to, ben to potential beneficiaries. Then we also have the problems with EHRs that um, both um, Sutheer and Ding have already have already mentioned. Uh, one thing that I just want to point out uh, addition uh, additionally is that while uh, their learnings were still focused to like one major large. uh one uh, major healthcare uh, healthcare chain in india and in and so there's in some and uh, in the case of private actors this the these problems get further heightened in the case of already uh underserved and under resourced settings and the whole premise of uh the functioning of these systems is the requirement of more data so those already with um reduced access to digital tools um, cannot frequently be using ehrs or ph or personal health records as uh, the ndhb um, terms it and as a result what then happens is that since these uh, these information systems work best with greater frequency of their use uh, it's it then so ends up happening that uh those who are already on the margins then further get marginalized let alone the problems that um doctors and uh doctors nurses and other practitioners in uh, hospital systems already face in terms of being using uh, in terms of being able to use these systems and these are in uh settings with lesser uh, constraints to uh, resources uh i want to i'm going to stop with that and will i'm happy to take any more uh, questions on on anything i can try to cover to sum it up aish is essentially saying that technology can't really solve all of the welfare side of the challenges which healthcare is for like if considering the pandemic that's going on right now it's increasingly clear that uh, privatization of insurance as a model for healthcare is not enough uh to summit it in that aspect of the welfare side of things uh we're going to open up for questions uh i think we have around 20 minutes uh if you have any questions please type it in the question and a uh we are also running few polls taking some feedback about how the events been uh kindly answer some of those questions and if you uh i will let people ask the questions themselves i have one question to sudeep from srikant uh srikant i am turning you uh, i am allowing you to talk and you can ask the question directly to sudeep you need to unmute yourself yeah uh, so my question was uh, sudeep was mentioning that uh, currently for research purposes uh, the data uh acquisition happens only through hospitals and not uh and patients don't even uh, are, are not even aware because it's it's past data but how do you see with this uh and uh, digital health data blueprint and how things will change would say patients be uh asked for consent 
for say some procedural data that happened for five years ago and would they have say a chance to not be part of the research and so on um good question and uh, one that i've had multiple uh, uh, thoughts over but i don't think as far as the national uh, health blueprint uh, i might be wrong but i do not i'm not aware of uh, of this being uh, talked about um, in the blueprint as such on how uh, you know these these finer elements will actually be taken care uh, in my opinion i think uh, doing something like data access dividends is, is very very ambitious and i, I don't think uh, you know, it's it's uh, feasible in the near term um but i do think you know something like opt out of clinical research or uh, allowed or or maybe in the future you know being able to use that kind of data infrastructure to ask patients to voluntarily submit the data uh, you know could be could be sort of frameworks that uh, the government could explore but but i don't think we have access to to this question at this point today the way it stands is that um, you know the hospital owns the data and tomorrow maybe the government could for public health um, use cases uh, mandate that hospitals open up data for you know say something like tuberculosis or coronavirus right now the government is um, i know putting their weight behind hospitals to get them to share their data but beyond public health issues um, you know uh, it's difficult to say how this is going to pan out um, and how uh, you know what role the digital blueprint can play in in ensuring there is some patient consent involved in the entire process you have a follow up shrikan no okay uh so we have some more questions on the q and a so, sorry it's from youtube uh, where we have live streaming it i think someone was asking if there are any good resources to learn more about the chinese approach and if there is any startup activity in the area of enabling ehr adherence like from a compliance standpoint of view do you know any anything about that sutip good question uh, resources see chinese um, um, i think ehr um, uh, adherence or implementation i think uh, uh, there are multiple books uh, on the us system and what is wrong with the us system i personally think there are good books like digital doctor um and multiple books by arik topol which talks about um about how the digital revolution in in us and and how bad the emr systems are um i think the most uh, you know uh, commonly cited uh, literature around this is is the entire implementation of the high tech act um uh, in the us uh, which which basically gave rise to the implementation of ehr systems um across uh, across uh, all of us uh china i have personally not myself come across literature which talks about how they're doing it uh what i only what i do know is is anecdotal data that that many startups in start in china claim to have access to data from you know 700 hospitals uh you know and 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 a scale of of several millions of uh, you know patient studies which which is basically unheard of uh, for anyone in any other country so i only have anecdotal i have not seen any resources um, if i find i i would i uh, i myself am looking so uh, i haven't found anything so far uh, uh could i chime in here yes yes please so um yeah so i th- i think on you know uh, like how we talk about any digital um, story from the outside looks pretty wonderful but i also happen to have done field work in chinese hospital as well um the current what we are talking about in terms of the issues with a uh, electronic patient record is being faced in china as well as in uh as in uh in in india or in any other country and you know the the issue that um uh sutra talked about in terms of uh the data being held by the hospital it's also the same case in china yes there are initiatives to push for more open data sharing but that's currently not there Um so just to give you an example if a patient want to have their um digital patient record out of the hospital impossible the hospital itself won't allow it currently the most common practice is that the hospital would give a print out version of the digital health record and then for the patient to take 
to take it uh, somewhere with them. Even for after the patient is discharged, the store uh, the storage of the digital health record is not. Uh, is, is not the storage of the old digital health record. Again, it's the printout being scanned and put back into the, the system. And this is not just within one hospital. There are several hospitals that are doing this. So yes, there are initiatives pushing for this. And especially, you know, along the coastal line of China where the digital development is further and more digital literacy. Again, a lot of hospital, because they are um, national owned hospital, that's the most common type of hospital in China, they are under resourced. Um, so investing in digital infrastructure is lower on their least comparing to uh, the procurement of an MRI machine, uh, EPG, all of that. So this is my two cents. Thanks, Ting. Uh, I'm launching the second poll. Uh, if you want for, for the feedback. Uh, meantime, I'll ask one more question that's in from YouTube. It's on consent. I think it's Karthik Vishwanath. He's asking, how can we build effective and meaningful consent standards from patients while we also move towards greater data sharing, especially during a pandemic when swift action is key to design interventions? It's open to anyone. Ding, ding. Can you tell us about the current consent practices in Indian hospitals? Um, in the concern in terms of what? Data sharing, how are they collecting data, are they informing the patients? Um, I don't think I have a good answer for that. That is something I didn't look into because when we were looking, doing field work in, uh, in the Indian hospital, we actually specifically limited ourselves the interaction we could have with, uh, with patients because the focus would be on... Um, on a hospital side, that for one. And secondly, if we were to conduct field work with patient, uh, that process in itself is yet another consent nightmare. So we sort of, for the initial study, we decided to not get too involved in, in that. So I don't, I don't know, I don't have a good answer for that. However, if it's a research hospital that might be slightly different while consenting um, to the hospital of receiving treatment, there could be a subclass on uh, consenting the hospital itself um, using the data for research purposes. But that's a for research hospital and that's a slightly more common practice across, not just in India, in China, as well as in the UK. I mean, right now, whenever I go to a hospital, like if it's a fairly modern hospital, they actually create a EHR record of my data based on my phone number. So you have to go through it. And whenever the doctor actually gives you a prescription, the nurse would not let you take the prescription without scanning it. So they have scanners everywhere and they just scan it. I don't know if they're doing, uh, well, the concerns like in flight that we will take your data for now. Uh, but so, so, so there, do you have any understandings of how people can build uh, any consent-based solutions or is it going to remain this way? Um, I think it's a tough problem to solve uh, purely because of, um, you know, how you get access um, or who you get, how you get, um, how, how you enable the patient to be able to provide you that consent. Uh, you know, either you're going to end up with a system where you need, uh, you know, identifiers all the way up to you know, mobile number which to provide you some kind of consent. In many cases, it's not the patient who is in a position to be able to give you consent, but often the caregiver uh, who is going to be a family member or, or someone else. Um, so I think it's a very tough problem, even in cases where, you know, you want to do a lot of uh, trials and clinical trials, um, research projects. Um, you know the consent is uh, you know is, is usually done telephonically um, and and you know and the percentage of people you are able to reach and get that consent itself uh, you know is, is usually you know uh, is, is usually you have such huge uh, percentage drops uh, and it's never possible to reach out them um, so I think it's it's a you know, fundamentally I think broken problem and 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 needs a lot of uh, needs a lot of uh, thinking uh, to get to, to a stage where, um, where we can talk about uh, a system that works. I wanted to add uh, a little Please thing. Yeah, th th this coming from 
um, the citation in the Shri Krishna committee around uh, from Arthur, Arthur Leff's article called contract as a thing. So uh, where the basic proposal is that contract should be treated as a product. So then, um, then the ready regime of product liability gets invoked and data fiduciaries are liable as if the consent form itself was a product. So uh, then sort of data collectors would have the obligation to um, sort of take, take on more substance, substantive obligations such as showing the notice before any such any practices are communicate that are communicated in the notice uh, requiring affirmative consent without any pre-checked boxes not having boilerplate clauses, ensuring that um, that sort of that the use of their data is communicated, um, read, and understood before, uh, so that informed consent can be provided. And this sort of adds in uh, to again use a term from um, uh, that is commonly used in sort of the fintech and the uh, app building space is that of, uh, it, that of introducing friction. And there is an inherent challenge here because this introduces friction, but it's important to introduce this friction, but there is a lot of resistance to, to this. And the other thing that I want to quickly say is that, um, so while the current outbreak has thrown up uh, solutions that, that are data heavy and um, since I do not have the expertise to comment on there being like alternate epi epidemiological models that can address these, one thing to still to still be said is that um, it's not uh, this dichotomy is a false one that uh, that of being able to um, only uh, that only being data subjects allows uh, would allow analyses of. Uh, uh, analyses, let's say, in an uh, epidemiological crisis. It's that these systems um, should have a shelf life, which is what usually isn't the case. The, these then end up taking the shape of pervasive surveillance systems that extend too far beyond uh, what their initial use was. And this is what we see with technological systems generally as well that get implemented by the state in terms of like shifting goalposts when um, either their use changes or they are rendered not particularly useful for uh, the use that they were initially thought of. And that is something which I can anticipate happening with the ROV Setu app, for example. So the, the point being that uh, this one is both a consent, uh, is, is something that needs to be addressed both from the prong of consent and as well as the, from the prong of uh, having sort of accountability in terms of uh, uh, and purpose limitations in terms of how uh, data systems can be later misused. Thank you, Aish. I think that was a question as well. How does uh, RQ Setu app kind of relate to the national health data blueprint and what happens in healthcare emergencies? Uh, I guess you have answered that. Uh, I don't think there are any more new questions. Maybe I, we can just wrap it up. Uh, if you have any final comments that you guys want to add, please jump in. Okay, I guess that's it then. Uh, so to to simply sum it up, this we can't look at the whole health infrastructure in an isolated way because these are very similar to other infrastructure, other digital infrastructures that are coming up. For example, consent for healthcare will be similar for consent for some other uh, online mechanisms because the electronic consent form is the standard that is uh, being built for any Digital India solutions. So we can't look any of these systems in an isolated way, especially in terms of the society and the law and how technology can affect it. On that note, I have one final question for the poll and please uh, take that and we will end the session. 